Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm here in today to introduce the webinar entitled Flow Cytometry, Essential Instrument and Experimental Design Considerations. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and Chroma Technology Corporation. Chroma Technology Corporation is a 100% employee-owned, socially and environmentally conscious manufacturer of optical interference filters, specializing in durable, high-transmission precision optics for fluorescence and other light-based applications and instrumentation. Chroma's filters are used in everything from simple gel reader documenting instruments to the latest iteration of Stead Storm Palm Structured Illuminated Microscopes from breadboard-based custom laser instruments to standard and custom flow configurations. Current Protocols is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures that are available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 15,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. We have allotted one hour for today's program, but our speakers have agreed to stay on a bit longer to answer as many of your questions as possible. You can submit your questions throughout the event by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom right side of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. J. Paul Robinson is the current SVM Professor of Cytomics and Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. He is a past president of the International Society for Advancement of Cytometry, ISAC, and has been working in the field for over 30 years. He is also the managing editor of Current Protocols in Cytometry. Dr. John Nolan leads a group developing cytometry instrumentation and applications at the La Jolla Bioengineering Institute. He is on the editorial boards of Cytometry and Current Protocols in Cytometry and is the current president of ISAC. A very warm welcome to both of our presenters, and we'll begin with Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Gwen, and welcome to the first Current Protocols in Cytometry webinar. And I thought that in order to begin this, I would like to explain to you how Current Protocols works and give you some background information on Current Protocols in the hope that this will uh, encourage you to use Current Protocols in a more effective way. And at the end of the webinar, I'm going to give you the addresses and contact information for all of the editors. So the first question that people ask is, uh, how do we get our protocols? Firstly, they are written by over 550 authors, and these are the people who are really the experts on each particular protocol. And how are they tested and how are they evaluated? Well, we require that the author of every protocol has actually performed the protocol and has tested it and verified it. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Current Protocols is such a high level uh, product is because we really are I mean, ensuring the, the quality control of, of those protocols. And then the next question is how often are they updated? And the, the beauty of current protocols is that we do update them about three or four times a year. And the uh, protocols are added at that time or older protocols are updated. So if we see a new application, if we uh, identify a major changes in any application, then we will update that protocol. So that gives you some background into how we operate current protocols. So who's on the board? Uh, Gwen has introduced myself and John Nolan, and we have a variety of other individuals, as you can see here on the screen, from uh, different places around the country. So. Uh, each of us is responsible for different components, and we are the ones that go out looking for those protocols. So how do we find the protocols? So the first thing is that current protocols editors are responsible for enlisting 
the protocols. So we don't take protocols from individuals. Uh, we, we actually go out looking for them ourselves. Now that's not to suggest that we will not uh, evaluate a, a protocol that is sent to us, but it is critical that we have the opportunity of carefully reviewing those protocols and making sure that they fit within the model that we have. So current protocols in cytometry is now in its 16th or 17th year, and we have so far made 64 updates. So those of you who have uh, seen the current protocols in cytometry, big red volumes on the shelf, this is the last 16 years of protocols and you will see that uh, we have a, a huge range of uh, areas that we cover. So here are the 13 chapters in current protocols. And it, within current protocols in cytometry, the first things that we address are the instrumentation. And cytometry covers both flow cytometry and image cytometry. So you'll see that chapter one is on flow cytometry instrumentation and chapter two is on imaging cytometry instrumentation. And then there are areas of importance that have been large enough for us to generate a significant number of protocols. And I'm going to go through some of those again to uh, uh, equilibrate all of you as to how current protocols operates. So in chapter one, we currently have 28 units and each chapter contains units and I'll explain the two types of units that we have in a moment. So here you'll see all the technology of flow cytometry. And I strongly encourage those of you who are new to the field to read these units because they're really outstanding units that explain in great detail how flow cytometers work. And you will hear later on in this webinar, John Nolan gives some very specific details in calibration, the, the most critical part of uh, setting up a, an instrument. And th those uh, protocols are all somewhere in the current protocols in cytometry. So at the end of the volume, there's four very important sections. First of all, there's a section on abbreviations and useful data that uh, will, will come in handy. And you may not even know that it's there if you haven't gone through uh, the current protocols, which I hope is sitting up on your shelf in the lab. And Appendix 2 talks about the solutions, the stock solutions that we refer to all the way through the current protocol. All equipment that is referenced in current protocols and laboratory guidelines will be in Appendix 2. And then Appendix 3 has what we call commonly used techniques. And I just thought I'd show you a few of those commonly used techniques, such as cell counting, for example. And this, this is a technique that you will require uh, for probably most of the protocols in current protocols in cytometry. So this is, this is something that you can uh, go and take a careful look at. And I'm sure that you will learn a lot about the principles of, of using various cell counting techniques. And the, the, uh, the, the other areas such as production of monoclonal antibodies, uh, production of polyclonal sera. These are, again, general techniques that are important in labs that uh, probably do flow cytometry and, and related areas. So how are the units structured? We have two types of units. And the first unit type is a commentary unit. We use commentary units to explain to you the principles and fundamentals of, of, of a particular area. So many of the technology, the chapter one, are going to be uh, commentary units and chapter two, because we're explaining to you what is flow cytometry, what, uh, what are the fluidics, 
what are the electronics, how are the data analyzed, what are the tools that are used. And so each of those will have a background, we'll discuss the critical parameters, we'll give you some kinds of uh, ideas about uh, the difficulties and how you can uh, troubleshoot those difficulties, and of course literature references and hopefully some uh, recent internet resources. And then we move to the traditional protocols. And these are the protocols that you should be able to take those few pages out of this manual or print them off your uh, electronic version and you should be able to repeat these protocols precisely. And every detail of how to perform an assay is going to be presented. Now we don't just present a single protocol in, in often we present three or four, sometimes six or eight different versions of the protocol depending on the type of cell or the source of the cells uh, that you're going to be using. And in every case we provide the materials and methods and every single step in that protocol. And they're literally numbered and this is designed to ensure that you, you have a precise uh, uh, assay to follow. Now you may end up and, and probably will end up developing a modification of a current protocols, uh, protocol to fit your needs and, and that's fine. And at the end of a protocol there will be a discussion, a commentary section, which is going to discuss why the protocol is set up the way it is and how what sort of results you should get. And frequently we'll provide example results. We'll also tell you how long it will take and we'll give you literature uh, examples. Now every couple of months we put up what new protocols are available and so I just took the protocols that are listed as the, the newest protocols uh, in the April 2013 uh, update and there is a, a unit 9.2 assessment of cell viability. Now clearly 9.2 is not a new unit, it's an updated unit and so that unit will, will have new information on it about assessment of cell viability. Perhaps a new dye that is available, perhaps another technique or an additional protocol. And you'll see uh, another two units in uh, uh, in chapter 9 and a unit in chapter 12. So these are the newest protocols that are coming on board. And then those units are already available but we also give you some advance warning of units that are going to be in the next one or two updates. And I just wanted to point out one of these because uh, there is um, some units we make publicly available. Now you understand that to access current protocols you have to be a subscriber, but when we see a unit that is of particular importance, we often put this one up on the web for free. And I've noted one coming up soon on the cytometry in malaria, a practical replacement for microscopy. And this is a really outstanding unit and this one will have full public access. So this is the uh, sort of uh, review that you will get when you log into Current Protocols, go to the Current Protocols website and you will see what we have coming up soon. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about a, a couple of aspects of cytometry because I uh, w would like to encourage those of you who are new to the field to pay attention to some of the issues. One of those issues is safety and it's an issue of great importance in flow cytometry, particularly because of the nature of the technology, particularly if you are involved in sorting live human cells. And so we have several units in current protocols on safety and quality control. And I wanted to point out chapter three which is safety procedures and quality control. And th there are some introductory units, but then there is a unit that uh, tells you how to test 
the shelf sorter in your laboratory. It's a very detailed unit and it's quite a complicated process. But if you're going to be doing a sorting of live human cells, I strongly encourage you to spend a considerable amount of time on chapter three. And there are several methods that are identified in here for looking for contamination, aerosol contamination. That is what escapes from the flow cytometer that could be uh, hazardous and dangerous. And there is a particular unit on sorting of unfixed cells. And this unit has a great deal of detail in it. And I want to also address this issue by drawing your attention to the address on the bottom here. And I know that's a very long address and you can find this by going to the ISAC website, but you, can, you will have access to these slides after the seminar. And in here are a number of documents that I encourage you to look at that will uh, facilitate your review of the safety procedures in your laboratory. And uh, if you're a technician in the laboratory or a student in the laboratory, then uh, I encourage you to read these and make sure that your laboratory is following the rules and regulations because these are, at the end of the day, uh, critical safety procedures that you should be following. And unit 3.6 is here, and this unit is very, very detailed. And I'm not going to go through the detail, but just to show you one table that identifies the level of safety that you're required to utilize when you're uh, sorting live human cells. You can go to cytometry part A and you can read the special report that was published in 2007, which is based on that same protocol. And that is again a, a document uh, of, in great detail in flow cytometry safety. So the other area that I wanted to point out and not to give a lot of detail, but to point out that things are changing in the world of flow cytometry, where a few years ago, one to three colors was the normal. We moved to five to 10, and sometimes much higher than that. And with uh, CITOF data, for example, one might have 30 to 50 uh, tags. So this causes a, a complete revision of sometimes how we run our flow cytometers and how we analyze our data. And I wanted to mention this unit 117 on plug flow uh, cytometry that was written by Bruce Edwards and Larry Sklar. And again, not to go through the details of this, but this is an example of a unit in current protocols that discusses, discusses a changing paradigm of moving from a few tubes to literally hundreds or thousands of tubes for a single assay. There are other complications when you start manipulating large data sets. And I wanted to point out to you another unit, unit 6.2, where there's a discussion of multi-parameter analysis of intracellular phosphoepitopes in immunophenotype cell populations. And this gives you an example of the level of complexity that we are moving to in the field. And when you move to that level of complexity, you really have to spend a lot of time in designing your protocols. And I wanted to point this unit out because this unit has something like seven or eight, maybe nine different basic protocols. And each protocol is explaining how to prepare these very complex assays with, for different types of cells, in this case, uh, alcohol-based permeabilization, uh, detergent-based permeabilization, et cetera, using whole blood. So each of the applications are going to be different, and our current protocols is going to explain those in great detail. And then when you get to the analysis of these more complicated and more sophisticated assays, you will find a great deal of help, as you can see in this uh, 
6.2 current protocol. And then I'll just lastly talk a, a little bit about other very complex applications where there is a change in the way we operate from single tubes with the single sample to perhaps multiplexing. We have a whole chapter, chapter 13, on multiplexing, and there are several very detailed units here on how to design your multiplexing assays. Now, many of these assays are not easy to, to set up, and uh, it really is important for you to spend the time to, to learn the process rather than waste the reagents. So th there is real value in, in going through the current protocols. The last thing that I'm going to talk about in, in terms of uh, uh, complexity of assays is the MyFlowSite standard. And this may not be familiar to many of you, but there is a, an article, Unit 1018, on what we call preparing a minimum information about flow cytometry experiment. We call it MyFlowSite. And this provides all the additional information about a flow cytometry list mode file that allows somebody else to review that file, analyze that file, and understand that. And uh, I want to point out to you that there are many journals that require you to deposit the raw data from assays that you have in, uh, in the, any paper that you publish. And that is happening too with uh, the journal from our, our society, which is Cytometry A. And very soon, you will be required to apply my flow site standards to that paper. So I strongly encourage you to read the my flow site unit and start to appreciate how important it is for you to understand how to accumulate all the data about your assay because eventually you will be required to submit this to many journals before you can publish them. So I'll finish the first section uh, uh, now, and I'm going to hand over back to Gwen. Thank you, Paul, for your excellent presentation. We now welcome jo Dr. John Nolan, who will be discussing crucial considerations for calibrating and standardizing both flow cytometry equipment and actual assays. John? Thanks, Gwen. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to cover some of the, the key concepts in calibrating and standardizing flow cytometry measurements, as well as giving some practical examples of how this might occur uh, in specific contexts. First, I'm going to cover briefly why it is we want to standardize or calibrate the measurement. Then I'm going to review some of the available reference and calibration particles that are involved in various standardization uh, approaches. Um, and then I'm going to describe the use of these in some common standardization and calibration scenarios, including characterization of the instrument and characterization of a measurement that one would make on the instrument. Um, what I'm going to give you today is really a very brief uh, introduction and overview to calibration and standardization approaches. Um, the approaches I'm going to describe have been developed over many years um, by a variety of experts in the field. Many of them are described in detail in various current protocols units, um, some of which are listed here. Um, many of my slides um, were borrowed from a recent tutorial on cytometer performance characterization and standardization by um, Robert Hoffman, um, which will be available shortly through ISAC's e-learning portal, uh, Cyto University. So first, why should we standardize or calibrate? Um, the flow cytometer is an excellent quantitative measuring tool, but in order to take full advantage of its quantitative measurement capabilities, um, standardization and calibration is, is required. 
So briefly, standardization approaches allow one to compare measurements made on the same instrument over time, for example, um, or comparing measurements between different laboratories and different instruments. Calibration, by contrast, is deals with the reporting of uh, measured intensities. So a properly calibrated instrument allows one to report the brightness of your cells or particles in absolute units, and also um, is essential to being able to quantify the molecular features of a sample, for example, uh, the number of surface receptors on a cell of interest. Um, the optimal approach to either standardization calibration really depends on the application, the reagents, um, et cetera, that are involved in a, a, a particular measurement. Um, but what I'll try to do today is to highlight some of the most general concepts in standardization and calibration. So first I'll review the types of standard or reference particles that are available to, to assist the user in, in calibrating their instrument. Um, and the one I'll start with first is a microsphere that is stained with a specific fluorophore. Um, for example, FITSI or phycoerythrin. These beads are stained with, surface stained typically, with, with those actual fluorophores. Um, and the beads, those specific fluorophore stained beads can be calibrated against some external reference, um, typically a solution of, of fluorophore. Um, and uh, uh, units of uh, molecules of equivalent soluble fluorochrome to, can be assigned to each of those beads so that when one runs these sets of beads on a flow cytometer, one can generate a calibration curve which allows you to um, convert the arbitrary median fluorescence channel um, into absolute units of MESF. Um, and so this is this is the first type of calibration particle that is, is are, and these are commercially available. So to give an example of how the MESF of these particles is determined, um, typically uh, a solution of dye of a known concentration is measured in a spectrofluorimeter, um, and then a suspension of fluorescent beads um, of a known concentration is measured in that spectrofluorimeter. Um, and if you know the particle concentration, one can, in a very straightforward way, estimate the number of fluorochromes per bead. Um, commercial manufacturers uh, will do this for you and assign uh, uh, an MESF value to the beads. Um, it's possible to confirm these yourselves in your own lab. Um, uh, and the accuracy of these measure measurements are you know, predictably uh, determined by the accuracy with which you measure your concentrations of, of fluorophore and beads. This can be done, and this can be done very accurately. Second type of reference particle is a so-called hard dyed bead. So these are fluorescent beads that are not stained typically with a fluorophore that you would use to label an antibody with, but is stained with a different fluorophore that uh, has fluorescence in the same spectral region. Um, so the advantages of hard dyed beads is they tend to be uh, much more stable and less expensive than the specific fluorochrome beads. Um, the, the staining can also be made typically more uniform than using specific fluorochromes, which results in a, a tighter coefficient of variation, or CV, um, which, is, which is attractive for um, some calibration purposes. Um, the drawback of the hard dyed beads is that they are not spectrally matched to the fluorochrome that you have on your antibody, for instance. And in the graph at the uh, bottom left, you see the, a comparison of the emission spectra of FITSI, of PE, and of a uh, 
fluorescent dye used to stain a commercially available hard dyed bead set. So this presents a, a problem for um, calibration in absolute units uh, because if you if you try to do these measurements on an instrument with a different filter setup or a different laser power, for example, you'll get a different uh, result. Um, but a practical solution is to cross calibrate these hard dyed beads against some specific fluorochrome beads um, and make your own assignments um, of MESF values to the hard dyed beads. These assignments will only be accurate on the instrument that you did the cal cross calibration uh, on. It won't be a valid assignment for a different instrument with, for example, different filters or uh, different laser power. Um, but with this in mind, uh, Cross-calibrated hard dyed beads are uh, a very convenient uh, reagent for calibrating and standardizing flow cytometry measurements. So both the specific fluorophore stained bead and the hard dyed beads you know, are typically available either as single beads of a single intensity or as multi-intensity sets, um, which have advantages that I'll describe um, in, in a couple of minutes. The third type of reference or standard particle I'd like to introduce is uh, the reagent capture bead, um, best exemplified by the antibody capture bead um, that can be used as a, as a compensation standard, for example. Um, there are sets of beads commercially available um, that have different amounts of a capture reagent on them that uh, allow an alternative approach to, to calibration that I'll describe towards the end of my talk here. So now uh, with those basic calibration particles uh, introduced, I'd like to cover just some common scenarios that, uh, that a user uh, might encounter. And the first is, is, is the instrument working? This is sort of the minimalist uh, approach to uh, standardization and typically involves the measurement of a hard dyed bead with a narrow CV. Um, uh, typically when you're starting up an instrument before you run your samples. Um, often the intensity at some standard defined PMT voltage um, can give an indication of how that the instrument is, is uh, working well. Um, in, in the, the old days and maybe even uh, currently, it's a common practice to adjust the voltage to set um, the, the position of that bead in a specific channel from day to day. Um, the CV of the particle, of, of the measured particle, can give an indication that your instrument is or isn't well aligned. Um, and these, this, this type of bead is probably run in Every core facility, um, you know, at the beginning of the day, um, and you know, it's, it's sort of the, the minimal threshold for you know standardizing your instrument. Slightly more useful question is: Is the instrument working well? And this is an example where multi-intensity beads um, come in handy. Um, the the very bright. Um, Alignment bead with the narrow CV um, will give will give the information I just described, um, but by having beads of different intensity, one can also uh, establish and quantify system linearity, as well as sensitivity, which is best best defined as your ability to resolve very dim populations of particles, and so even just Visually, without any uh, quantitative analysis, one can get a, uh, an idea that the instrument is working well and is going to be able to resolve dim populations. Um, at the end of my talk, I'll talk about how these beads can be used to measure some fundamental performance metrics of, of the instrument that uh, has some distinct advantages. A third level of question is how bright are my cells? And the goal here is to report data not in relative uh, units of intensity, but in absolute units of intensity. Um, 
There's a number of different intensity units that uh, have been defined for one purpose or another, um, the most fundamental being photons. Um, that's typically not a very useful number for most uh, biologists. The more interesting number is uh, the MESF molecules of, of, of fluorochrome. Um, and as I described earlier, if you run if you run these uh, calibrated beads, intensity calibrated beads um, on your instrument at the same instrument settings um, and conditions as your unknown sample, one can actually express those those the brightness of those cells in units of, of equivalent fluorochromes rather than just uh, median fluorescence intensity. And this is this is a a, a big advantage to having other people repeat your results uh, in the future, um, or even within you know a given lab to be able to uh, assess that the same assay is performing in the same uh, manner over time. A next level of calibration beyond just being able to report how bright your cells are is to actually estimate how many molecules are on your cells. The classic example being how many fluorescent antibodies are bound to a cell of interest. And for this, there are two different approaches that are, are really complementary. The first starts from the MESF, which as I described earlier is an absolute measure of intensity that can be traced to a, a standard of fluorophore um, in solution. And if, if, you, if you know the MESF and you know the fluorophore to protein ratio, that is how many dye molecules there are per antibody in this case, and you know how bright those fluorophores are bound to the antibody, um, one can, in a very straightforward way, estimate the number of antibody molecules bound to a cell. Um, so this, this, is, this is accurate. It will work for any fluorescent ligand, not just antibodies, but um, any, any peptide or other ligand that you can fluorescently label. The, the drawback of this approach is that um, MESF standards are not available for all floors. So FITC and PE um, MESF standards are available from a couple of different vendors. Um, there are some additional fluorophores that are also available calibrated in, in MESF, um, but for highly multicolor, so-called polychromatic experiments, um, where you're using a number of different fluorophores, including some of the tandem fluorophores, such as PE Psi 5 or PE Psi 7. Um, MESF standards aren't available, um, and so it's really not practical to calibrate all the channels. The second approach um, it uses the calibrated capture beads I discussed earlier, um, and in, in these protocols, one would simply stain these capture beads with the same fluorescent antibody that you used to stay in your cells um, and construct a calibration curve. Um, so this is very simple. It works in principle for any fluorochrome. It doesn't require that you know the F to P of the fluorochrome or how bright the floors on the antibody are. Um, the drawback is um, that in general, uh, not all antibodies are captured equally. So some isotypes um, some clones of antibodies, even monoclonals, uh, can be recognized to different degrees by the capture molecules that are on on the bead, and so that's uh, that's uh, that's a limitation of, of these pro these approaches. Um, finally, I'm going to get into you know sort of what is the state of the art in calibrating uh, uh, flow cytometry response. Um, and it gets at the uh, allows you to ask questions like, what is the absolute detection limit of my instrument? Um, and knowing and, and determining this requires knowledge of some fundamental parameters of the instrument: the detection efficiency, 
um, which we'll refer to as Q, which um, can have units of photons per MESF. Um, and it requires knowledge of the background of your system, um, which also can be expressed in MESF. But armed with these two performance numbers, um, you can predict the resolution between um, a dim cell, for example, and a blank cell. So the Q and B are most uh, uh, readily assessed using multi-intensity um, hard dyed beads, which have a narrow CV um, for bright samples. And as the intensity of the beads decreases, um, one can measure a broadening of the CV and a chief source of the broadening of that CV is photon counting statistics, which um, at, at low numbers of photons have a Poisson distribution. So knowing that the distribution is Poisson and measuring the standard deviation of the, the peak distribution um, as a function of intensity allows you to estimate Q and B. So Q, it's a measurement of the fluorescence detection efficiency of the cytometer. Um, and it comes from this broadening of the populations uh, as, as photons become more limited. Um, and the unit is, is photons, photoelectrons. If you have an MESF standard, for instance, specific fluorochrome beads that have been used to cross-calibrate your multi-intensity hard-dyed beads, um, Q will have units of photoelectrons per MESF. So by measuring the standard deviation of your, your population distributions of each of the different beads, um, one can calculate um, Q and B via this relationship, which is described in more detail, the derivation of which is described in more detail in the current protocols used unit by, by Hoffman. So as, uh, as I mentioned, if, if you don't have an MESF uh, calibrator, the units of Q are in photons. If you do um, run cross-calibration beads, you will have units of photoelectrons per MESF. Um, and a plot of the standard deviation squared versus the median channel number um, gives you uh, Q, which is one over the slope, and B, which is uh, the, the intercept times Q. So one can pull out Q and B from this analysis. And then what does one do with Q and B? Well, Q and B allow you to predict how your instrument will perform in measuring particles of uh, a given brightness. So a good example here is shown on the left is an instrument measuring multi-peak beads um, uh, with a high Q, whereas if the detection efficiency is lower, you get the sort of uh, distributions you see on the, the right where the low intensity beads are not well resolved. So if one were just looking at the bright bead, these two, uh, one might not be able to tell much of a difference in performance between these two instruments, but when one looks at the, uh, the lower intensity beads, um, the role of Q becomes um, quite clear. And so you know, we use this approach uh, to calibrate instruments that we're developing here um, and in this illustration, we've uh, used these multi-intensity beads to measure the response um, of our instrument. And then with Q and B measured, um, one can simulate what the expected distributions uh, would be for um, a relatively bright uh, particle and a dimmer particle. And then when you actually do that measurement, um, on the instrument, um, you can see you get, a, you get a very good estimate of what the actual data will be. And so this sort of represents the, the ultimate use of, of, 
of, of calibration and standardization where you can actually predict how an assay might perform on a given instrument. So uh, in summary, standardization is essential to allow results to be compared over time or between instruments and labs, while calibration um, improves that by one degree by allowing intensities to be reported in absolute units, which uh, can be compared between labs. Um, and regardless of whether your application is um, a qualitative one or a quantitative one, standardizing and calibrating your measurements increases their value both to you and to other researchers that might want to um, analyze your data or repeat your experiments. So this has been a very quick overview of the options for calibration and standardization that are available um, to someone running a flow cytometer. Um, many of these will be performed for you uh, by the people who run a core facility, if you run in a core facility, um, but they're all within the capabilities um, <clears throat> of, of, a, of even a moderately uh, educated user. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, there are a range of resources uh, to support proper calibration and uh, standardization. Um, these are the protocol units, the underlying primary references that, that validated those, those, uh, these protocols are um, included in the reference section of the protocols. And just to um, repeat, if this uh, information sounds uh, interesting or useful to you, you can find out more and view Bob Hoffman's 90-minute tutorial on cytometer performance and characterization and standardization um, at Cyto University, CytoU, which will be launching later this, later this month from ISAC. So with that, I'll close and take any questions. Okay, thank you so much, John. Actually, we're going to ad advance to the next slide. Uh, Paul, I believe you have some <coughs> educational resources that you wanted to present. So yes. Let's advance to the next slide, and you can de describe these. Thanks, Gwen. I wanted to just bring a few issues to the table here. We've already discussed a lot of the things in current protocols, and uh, John just mentioned Sato University, which is a new initiative that he has uh, developed as president of ISAC, and that's a very exciting opportunity that's going to come online in the next few months. <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to mention to people was the Purdue discussion list, which has now been, I think it's in its 23rd or 24th year. <clears throat> this has about 4,200 people on board, and it is an excellent mechanism for people to ask questions about uh, cytometry. If you are not a member of that, you cannot post. So you must send a message to subscribe at cyto.purdue.edu. That actually comes to a real person which happens to be me, and then we that goes into a list that uh, you receive a survey to fill out from Bartek Riva, and we'll only sign you up after we have uh, got your survey back. So it's not automatic by any means. And it is a reviewed and monitored list, so we try to be very careful to make sure it's high quality. I also want to mention Howard Shapiro's book, Practical Flow Cytometry, several editions of that. And it's an excellent book to read if you're new in the field of cytometry. ISAC Biosafety Committee, I mentioned that earlier. There's a lot of resources in there, as in the ISAC Education Group. And lastly, I earlier mentioned the MyFlowSite My standard, and I wanted to point out the Flow Repository, which is flowrepository.org. And if you go to that site, you'll see that just for this year, there is a listing of papers that have had the raw data published with the journal paper, and those are about 5,000 list mode files just for 
2013, mostly in the journal Cytometry. So this is an example of the application of MyFlowSite, and it's also an opportunity to go and take a look at the raw data from published files. And if we can move to the next slide, uh, I wanted to tell you who are the editors, and I mentioned at the very beginning that I would give you their addresses. We'll leave this slide up for a while, and you are welcome to communicate with any of the editors. Each editor has responsibility for different areas, and you can look in the Current Protocols website uh, to identify those areas. If you have uh, a strong desire to uh, communicate with us with a protocol you think is very good, is accurate, and is not in current protocols, please communicate with one of the editorial board and we'll consider that protocol. We'll uh, definitely communicate back with you. So I'll hand back over to you, Gwen, for uh, questions. All right, thank you, Paul. As, as you say, it's now time for the question and answer session. So if you haven't yet submitted a question, now is the time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the right side of your screen. Um, let's go ahead and see what has come in so far. Um, it's not always obvious which of you, John or Paul, will be the, most, um, the, the person to whom the question was addressed, so please go ahead and jump in. Uh, question number one, do you think CyTOF will eventually replace analytical cytometry and normal fluorescence-based cytometry will be relegated to sorting? Well, um, uh, it's Paul Robinson here. I think that as all new technologies come on board, they will take time for people to get used to them and f to identify the best applications for those technologies. And I believe CYTOF is no different to any other new technology that's introduced, that it has very, uh, very useful and very important applications, and it will take time for the applications to be developed, the protocols to be developed and defined, and the reagents. And I believe that, that uh, the CYTOF people are, are doing a very good job going down that pathway. John, did you have any comments on that? Well, so CYTOF, for those who don't know, is um, the use of mass spectrometry to make cytometric measurements. And as it's practiced right now, it's a, it's a great tool to use for labeling antibodies, for instance, and probably lots of other types of ligands. <clears throat> uh, it's probably not going to replace fluorescent proteins or calcium indicators or other, <laughs> other uh, measurements that one does with fluorescence, but, you know, clearly opening some new avenues, especially in highly, highly multiplex and multi-parameter measurements. All right, the next question, John, I believe this one is for you. Uh, it says, so is cross-calibration only possible for those channels where there is a fluorophore stained bead with MES value, MESF values? How do we calibrate other channels? That is, that is the million dollar question in calibration right now. Um, because some of the, uh, the popular fluorochromes, such as tandem dyes that I mentioned, you know, the PE conjugates and the APC conjugates, um, have a fair amount of variability from lot to lot. It becomes really hard to find an absolute standard for them and the way you can find one for fluorescein. Um, so um, uh, groups within ISAC and also with the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, NIST, um, are working on alternative approaches to this. One approach is the equivalent reference fluorochrome approach, uh, or ERF. It's, uh, it's a slight variation on the MESF approach that uses some other external standard. Um, it has some, some drawbacks as far as you know, not being spectrally matched and therefore not working well for different instruments with different filter setups, for example. Um, so there is no one good answer right now, but people are working hard on that because it's important. Okay, uh, again, I think, John, this one is perhaps for you. It says, uh, do you have or is there a specific protocol I can follow to calibrate the machine using Q and B, which is independent of the manufacturer? Yeah, so that's described in the uh, current protocols unit by uh, Bob Hoffman. Um, 
I should know what unit it is, but it's you know it's the unit called calibrating you know your flow cytometer, and that has a very detailed description of of how to do it. You know, it requires making the measurements um, and then doing a little bit of intermediate level Excel spreadsheet work um, to get that. And so you should be able to you should be able to do that yourself just by following the protocol. Um, although I'm sure Bob or I would be happy to answer any questions if you had them. You can find our emails uh, online easy enough. Okay, this one could probably be for either of you. It says, how can you make cells stabilized to be used as a control like the cells that are stabilized that are available on the market? So the the, the approach of using a biological standard, right, a, a, a preserved cell um, has been around for a while. There's a couple of products on the mar market, mostly uh, preserved blood cells, um, that are reasonably stable and do a fair job of mimicking a, um, a you know, a, a real fresh cell lymphocyte, for example. Um, but generalizing that to other cell types from other tissues, for example, um, there's, there, there really isn't a general way to do that. Um, I think it would have to be, those, those approaches would have to be optimized and validated by, you know, the individual who is interested in using them. Um, there's a lot of interest in having these sorts of stable biological standards. Um, and again, it's an area of active work, but right now your options are really limited to some, some okay uh, blood cell type standards. Okay, this next one is for Paul. It says, is DRAC5, it's D-R-A-Q, number five, being rolled out to any extent in resource-limited countries to improve diagnosis of malaria where cytometers exist? And if so, how can one get involved? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I have no idea if DRAC-5 itself is being used, but the whole idea of developing tools in our field that uh, are lower cost and can be used for such things as malaria, um, lower cost HIV uh, identification, or CD4 at least, uh, are very important areas. Um, there, uh, I know Howard Shapiro has written uh, a rather wonderful article on malaria uh, for current protocols, and I did mention this in the uh, earlier uh, talk that I gave, and I encourage people to pick up the paper when it comes out, which will be in the next month or so, it will be publicly available. Okay. Um, the next one, I, I guess, could be for either of you. It says, can you say something about linearity and sensitivity at different voltage levels of the same PMT? Um, so uh, the PMT response will be linear to um, uh, intensity over, over some range of voltages, and it will deviate from linearity Often at either very low or very high voltages, and you know, if you if you buy a commercial instrument, your inst your, your manufacturer will recommend you know the usable range, um, but you can also uh, measure you you, you can and should measure this yourself um, if you're concerned um, using beads again. There is a current protocols unit called measuring system linearity, and it involves making a measurement of two different intensity beads over a range of voltages and comparing the ratios of those fluorescence uh, measurements to, uh, to establish linearity. So it's a very straightforward protocol. It wouldn't take you more than a half hour to do it, and it's, uh, it's something everyone should do you know, at least once on their instrument if they're concerned. Okay. We've got a lot of really great questions, and we're going to continue on for a few more minutes with them, even though our hour is technically up. So feel free to stay on. Uh, our next one is... Can I use cytometry to count the number of bacterial cells accurately? So you can. Um, I didn't get into that aspect of calibration, but the whole issue of enumeration of, of, of cell number and concentration uh, is you know, a discussion on its own. Um, and you, if you look, you'll find a protocol that describes that in current protocols. Um, basically, what it involves is, is, is knowing your flow rate your sample flow rate of your instrument and the time uh, over which you measure. And these can be measured with beads. If you know the concentration of beads, you can measure them for a 
certain amount of time um, and you know, estimate estimate the flow rate and the volume that you analyzed. Um, some instruments um, actually measure the volume of sample that's delivered, so these so-called you know, volumetric, you know, quantitatively volumetric instruments, you know, can measure the volume directly. Although, you know, you can always validate that yourself using beads. I guess the only other comment is that you have to make sure that you're measuring single particles, sometimes with very small or dim particles, um, especially when you don't know the concentration. Coincidence um, can skew your results. Coincidence is what happens when you have two particles in the measurement volume at the same time, but they're counted as one. Um, so it is possible to absolutely enumerate the number of particles in your samples. Uh, yes. Um, I'll add a comment to that. Uh, John talked about uh, characterization of uh, sensitivity, and uh, that unit is 120. And another uh, unit that's uh, relevant to this discussion is 128, which is evaluation and purchase of an analytical flow cytometer, some of the numerous factors to consider. And that does talk about issues of sensitivity, of uh, linearity and how to test an instrument. And, all, and both of those units are, are really relevant to this discussion. Okay, this next question uh, says it's for Dr. Nolan. How does one select a particularly antibody for use in CYTOF? Are all antibodies suitable for heavy metal conjugation? Um, so uh, at, at the highest level, um, in principle, they should be. Um, in practice, it's, you know, it's your responsibility to validate. Um, you know, and that's it's been an activity of the, the early adopters of CYTOF is to go through and validate you know, antibodies that are used in fluorescence and validating them for use with a, one of these mass tags. Um, so in general, the answer is you know, probably yes. You know, in practice, you need to prove that. And my understanding is that you need a minimum of 100 micrograms of antibody. Uh, irrelevant to the concentration, but you need a minimum of 100 micrograms to go through the protocols for labeling. Okay, this next one is uh, most likely for both of you. It says, do you see ISAC providing a standardization role since NIST no longer provides beads with value assignments? You're the president, John. Mm -hmm. um, uh, ISAC is very interested in uh, Promoting and establishing best practices in calibration. Um, you know, I, I described the different approaches to calibration. You know, in principle, everyone could do that themselves, but you know, that's not practical. Having commercially available products that are traceable to some reference is, you know, clearly going to be valuable to the field. Um, and you know, how, how that gets done is, you know, a, a subject of active discussion. Um, uh, I guess I won't commit to more than that. At, at the moment, but you know, we're very interested in, in promoting that. Okay, I think we have time for probably two more questions here. One of them is: Are quantum dots feasible for application to flow cytometry? Um, the answer is yes, absolutely, and there's lots of examples of them being used. Um, and there is, in fact, a protocol on how to calibrate quantum dot measurements using flow cytometry. Um, in, in current protocols. So yeah, they're, they're widely used. They have some interesting features, you know, as far as their excitation and emission. Um, they, uh, you know, they have some limitations as well, um, which are you know, well described in the literature, but there's lots of new types of fluorochromes that are coming out that, uh, that are expanding, uh, expanding the, the, the color space available for flow. Okay, and one final question. Is there any way to calibrate for looking at microvesicles on a cytometer? What types of standards would you use? Uh, so this is a, this is a real uh, uh, active area and of, of, of some controversy. So the first, uh, the first uh, the point, and I'll make it here now in case uh, people haven't heard it before, is that you can't use beads to calibrate size on a flow cytometer. This is the, you can't use light scatter of, of beads. This is because light scatter depends not only on the size of the particle, but on the refractive index and the angle of collection um, and some other parameters. So that, you know, approaches that, that 
purport to use different size beads and, their, and, the, and then estimate the size of some particle are you know, generally not, not valid. Um, and this is especially true for very small particles uh, below the wavelength of light. Um, there's a lot of interest in standardizing the, uh, the response of an instrument uh, so that the measurement can at least be made reproducible. Um, but you know, microvesicles, things that are very small and near the detection limit of the instrument are hard to, hard to calibrate in terms of absolute size. Um, the fluorescent signals, by contrast, the number of antibodies bound, et cetera, can be calibrated in exactly the same way that, that you would do it for larger cells, as I described uh, earlier. Um, but this is, this is a, you know, an area of active work. I think what it's going to require in the long run are uh, instruments that are more sensitive by a factor of 10 or more. All right. Well, we are out of time and so must conclude the question and answer session. Uh, today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send each of you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to customize and print a certificate of attendance. You can also access the certificate of attendance right now from the Docs and Links tab at the right side of your screen. This concludes today's webinar and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols. On behalf of our speakers, Paul and John, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, Chroma Technology Corporation, we hope you've learned some valuable information, and it's goodbye for now. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs>